little bit and then the middle out a bit and then, you know. <laughs> but they have the crust, right? <laughs> and they give colours, but it would be so dark, so I don't know how bad that would Anyway, but um, maybe not harder. But um, there's the crust, and just while I was praying, I just felt like, I just saw this picture of the Earth's crust. And when you look <coughs> at a diagram, the Earth's crust is so tiny. Yet it's all we see. Everything we see is the very final layer of the earth. And underneath that, you know, you see a volcano. Something just slightly below the surface proportionately comes through. And I was just thinking, you know, during prayer, like, the love of God is like that. All that we build up on earth, all that we're trying to do is like that parable that Jesus said. It's like building our house on the sand. And just a bit of water just goes, washes it all away. And it's like the earth and what goes on on this earth and the kingdom of the world is only able to exist for a little bit on the very outer layer. Something happens beneath, it's gone. And it's amazing, like you see a big storm or a big wind, you start realizing, oh wow, we're really vulnerable. We're really small. Very, very small. And I just kind of saw it like God's love and what he's done on the cross, on a bit of the layer of the surface, on a rugged cross, this, this weak thing, not even fully human looking anymore, so smashed to bits, that was what Jesus did. That little body on that cross, as God humbled himself to be like that, just was Smash and then what came out of that was the most powerful kingdom and force has ever been in existence on this planet. And now the very foundations of our earth and the systems on which it's based on can shake and break and all sorts of things, and it will in time. Because something deeper and more powerful is at work amongst us. And that's the kingdom of God. And so sometimes we get discouraged because we see, we only see what we see sometimes. We're not looking into the deeper things of what's going on in the world, in the spiritual realm. And sometimes we can get discouraged about the way it looks like it's going. But I'll tell you what, something is more deep than what, is, what we can see. Something is more powerful is at work. And the very thing we think um, is all that there is can be broken and shaken by that. And that's the love of God that runs deeper than anything we can see, feel, or touch right now. And it's operating within us right here. You know? I, 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 yeah, it would be great if other people came to you know, church across the place this morning. But I believe something deeper is going on underneath the foundations of what people are setting up mm-hmm. over this place. We've got, you know, um, Alex and Katharina, they've planned a church in Kawarama. And I don't know exactly what the beginnings look like, but they've done something. Something that's of essence, the kingdom of God, which is deeper, more powerful and stronger. It doesn't matter what it looks like on the surface. So we, we are in the, mono, in the majority. Every time we get into the things of God, we're always in the majority. We're joining something in the supernatural realm that is greater, bigger, deeper, stronger than anything we can see. And it's the most powerful, most awesome thing that you can ever invest your life in. Um, so anyway, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that, that this message would be of your heart. Lord, we want more of you, all the things of you, but I want to just have an academic exercise. I want to touch the things of you and for you to touch our hearts as we look at um, what you want to say to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, endurance. What the Bible says about hashtag winning. Have you ever seen that? Hashtag winning. Have you ever seen hashtag blessed? If you're not on social media, you are blessed. Uh, but, <laughs> and you still don't know what I'm talking about. But there's this thing that goes on on social media, like Facebook, Instagram, maybe Twitter, I don't know, all these things. And they have these things of, just skip ahead actually, there's one that says blessed. Uh, there we go, blessed. Hashtag blessed. Oh, yeah. And we live in this culture where we portray something, that's what it's called. You know, have you ever seen that? Hashtag blessed. In case you're wondering, just if you're trying to do sign language, uh, I know as much about sign language as the layers of the earth. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, anyway, there's a, maybe a little bit more. Okay, so hashtag blessed. And so, hashtag winning, 
has to take place. What does the Bible say about what it means to be a winner? You know? Uh, when you, you know, next year I'll probably have an opportunity to go to a, I probably won't go because it's in New South Wales and I can spend all that money and travelling and things like that for this reason. But next year I'll have an opportunity to go to a high school reunion, a 20 year high school reunion. Uh, and I just thought about this whole idea of what it is to win, be successful, be blessed, all that type of thing. And I just thought in that context, it's like, some people in school probably don't value like God stuff as much as me. So how will I appear like I'm winning? Like, what's my success story? And you know, people sometimes will not go to these things because they feel so insecure about their lives that they're not winning enough or being successful enough. And um, it's ingrained into our culture. What it is to be a winner, successful, doing well. And I, I, I'd like to put you today in a challenge that what the world says is winning, what the world says is, even sometimes, even using a spiritual term, blessed, is not all that. It may not be actually the indicator of being a winner or blessed in God's eyes, right? But whatever God says is true, is true. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? So if you want to be a winner, do it God's way, because that's the only way you will be able to win. If you try and be a winner any other way, it's not actually winning. It's just a lie and a distraction and a, a, a deterrent for, for actually really winning in life. Um, but it was in, this thing just to do that mental exercise about feeling like, what is, what is it to be blessed and what is it just to be a winner? And being a Christian is the most humble thing you can do in your life. Because you're laying your hand down your life as Christ did for us, for Him to be Lord. And all of a sudden, our value system lines up with His. The idea of success and being good at stuff all has to come and, and be laid down as an idol. There is an idol of being successful or achievements. You know, Paul, I was, had this in there and took it out, but Paul, you know, he said he was going to talk like a fool. And he started to go on about his achievements that people around him would be impressed by. He goes, look, even if you wanted to go by this, I win. But let me tell you, I'm in the place of power to say I'm the best Pharisee. Like, I've been the most persecuted. I've, I've done it all. Everything you think you're so good at, I'm actually, he goes, I'm a fool to talk like this. I'm better. Even, I'm a better Christian than you. It's like, oh man, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> and it actually writes in the Bible when we're reading this. It's like, well, um, I'm, I'm actually the best because I'm a fool. But then he goes, I count it all as a loss. I count it all as poo. <laughs> essentially. Compared to the surpassing greatness of God. It's all counts for nothing. And so our life in Christ is not about elevating our success, our achievements and everything like that. It's about laying it down for the glory and honour of God. It's the most humble thing that we do. But it's the only place we can find life. And freedom. We were born to be worshippers of our amazing God. We were born to be in connection and relationship with Him. And not allow all this stuff to get in the way. Not to be like the, the seed that grows up, chucked by thorns, the worries of this world, wealth, and all sorts of things. It's just like, no, get rid of it. Be free, be fruitful. And so, um, so this, this thing about the persecuted church has, has a bit of a focus. And, and what it is to endure. The endurance. It kind of for me, it's like, oh, here we go. And I start reading the scriptures and I'm just like, man, this is heavy. What, what Christ is wanting us to do. Let's look at that. So I'm jumping around, Austin, you're doing really well. But Matthew 10, verse 21 and 22. Like, I don't find these scriptures particularly uplifting if I don't look at them in the right light. It says, Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents who have been put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. <laughs> Lovely. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. You'll be the winner. And then I say, if you can endure all that, you'll be a winner. What does it say in the next one? Is there another one next to it? Matthew 24, 9 to 13. Then you'll be handed over and be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved, will be the winner. It doesn't look like 
there's much winning going on in these scriptures that Jesus said. But you can be a winner if you stand firm. Now, all this sounds too heavy and too hard to be honest. If you miss something. There's something vitally important that we need to actually even look at that and think, yeah, I'll do it. And that's this. It's the love of God. Mm -hmm. Revelation 2 and 3, churches were rebuked. Some of them were doing exceptional things. And some people were rebuked because they had forsaken their first love. You see, like I mentioned before, that kind of picture that got in my head, God's love is deeper and stronger than all that. That seems pretty hectic and serious, doesn't it? Being hated, persecuted, somebody put, put to death, you know? But like I've said, in, in, I think I haven't mentioned this for a while, so I'll say it again, one of my favourite little stories of the Bible. Stephen was being stoned to death. But do you think he was worried? He wasn't worried one little bit. He is the happiest tortured person you've ever met. He just stood there, boom, boom, rocks pumping into his body, taking, you know, just absolute pulverizing. He's looking up with so much joy because his eyes were fixed on Jesus. God was doing something, drawing him closer and deeper. He was a man in love with God. So deep. It did it. It was to such to an extreme level in that moment, and God's grace was obviously on the situation, that it bypassed what was happening in the natural. So if you have, have a love, a supernatural love for God, you can go through everything because everything else is like the surface of the earth. It's like just a bit at the end. We, we look at this and we think, wow, be hated? I can't handle being hated. I need to be liked and affirmed and built up. You know, but we're all a bit like that, aren't we? I, I need to be needed and loved and be okay in life. If I go into a new situation, I'm like nervous and insecure and trying to find my place. And uh, I'm like that too. People would know that because I'm in my place right here, so I'm in place. But in different environments, I want to try to find my place in that. And it's like, it seems too much. And my hope for my life, and, I, and it's a reality that can be, is that my love for God would override everything else. And I could just be free. And even Jesus endured the cross. It was the love of the Father. Even though it was hard, right? It was hard. He's the only one that had to go through it. And, and, and feel like his father had forsaken him. He's the only one that had to carry that in that moment too. We get to carry all this with the father, with God inside of us all the way. And that's his grace. If we go back, sorry, I said, you're doing a great job. There's a, what else is there? There's a, I'll plug this in. Yeah. But uh, there was a time a couple of years ago, I think it was now, um, no, that didn't work. Uh, a couple of years ago where Brooke was really ill and she had to have a defibrillator placement. For those that know, she's had two cardiac arrests and nearly died. Kind of a miracle story at the same time that she's alive and doing well. Um, she's had that surgery in America and all sorts of wonderful things. But anyway, she had to have a defib, uh, all the leads in her heart that were, it was a product recall. You don't want to have a product recall with leads that are embedded all the way through your heart. It's probably not the thing you want to be on recall. But she had then uh, surgically implanted when she was 15. You know, she, she hadn't probably finished growing yet, which made it even harder. Someone had died and we were trying to get these out. So, you know, whatever. Anyway, so they got these leads out. And it was hard because of the growth and the scar tissue and everything like that. They had never seen such a bad reaction to someone uh, with that surgery. That she was so ill, so sick, so, so sick. She had multiple men trying to hold her down. She just was not in a good place. Not, not, not in a good place. And the trauma I was experiencing myself was pretty hectic. You know, prior to that, there'd been uh, some time, maybe even years, of just it being so hard. So, so hard. I didn't have to work out whether I loved the or not. I always loved the group. And I loved God. But it was so hard. Health wise, I'm trying to be a mum and a dad and a carer and all these things I'm so not natural at. And every day was a grind and a 
push and the chronic fatigue was hectic and everything just, and then backing up, and that's the time I'm like, God, I'm not cutting the tension anymore, it's ridiculous. And it's like, how about I just do something else? And he's like, no, I'm like, ah, and you like came in my grace is sufficient to you. And every Sunday, I probably didn't look as dead as I felt every other moment of the week. And someone gave me a prophetic word and said, there's a Samson anointing on your life. God's anointing will be on you when you need it, and then come off you again. It's like, can I just stay? But, uh, <laughs> and it was like that. And so I, I stopped stressing so much about prepping for Sunday because for that time, it was like, God's grace is going to come on me. And then when I go home, and you're like, oh. And it was so hard. And it was, I have to say, it was lonely as well because you want to do life with someone and they're so ill and they're in pain and it's like, Arr! And you wonder why. This is terrible. Why are we going through all this? But when I thought I might lose Brooke, that's when I realised, oh my goodness, I can't not have Brooke in this world with me. I'll take all the trouble. I'll take all the struggle. I'll take it every day. God, I don't want to lose it. I remember having a moment with Brooke's dad because he journeyed through the hospital experience and I just bawled my eyes out. I didn't realise how much she meant to me. And during this is a video that happened during the time. Every day Sammy would pick a flower and I would take a picture of it and send it to Brooke, whether she was conscious enough to see it or not, I didn't know. But this is what we did, because I'm doing school pick-up, drop-off, other things, and um, what, what does he say? This is like a 10-second video, but this is also, I'm not the only one that love, loves Brooke, my boys love her too. Just, just play that, you might play it, I promise. Oh, so, get some sound happening. Um, just play it a couple of times, so what he says. Yeah, yeah. So he says to a message to mum, what do you want to say, mum? You love me. You're my friend. Just play one more time. Just for my own sake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you love me. Yeah, just you love me. You love me. You can see, like, in his little body, there's something in there that's like, I love my mum. And in that time, I realised the love that we have, this is just from my heart, and maybe God helps me, the love that we, we would, I'm like, I'm gonna, I want to go through more. I just need to have her, right? I'll go through anything. I just need to have Brooke in my life. I need her to be there with my kids. We need to have this person. We love her so much. And you know what? The love that God has for us and the love that we have for God. We can look at all the persecution. We can look at all the trouble. We can look at the intensity. In the moment, like, is this even worth it? But the thought of not having God is a scary thought. It's like, no, I'll, I'll do one more. I'll do every day with trouble and hardship. I just can't have not have you, God, in my life. And that's where God wants us to be in our heart. I use an example that we can relate to, but that's where God wants us to be with Him. You know, what does he say? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, shall anything separate us from the love of God? No, nothing. Neither height nor depths, angels nor demons, nothing in all creation will ever, I'm paraphrasing the scripture, nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. When we tap into that deep, I'll type that down. When we tap into that deep love, we can do anything. We can go through anything. <laughs> and we don't have that foundation. All that just seems too hard. Yeah. But in the context of the love of God, which runs so much deeper than that, it doesn't matter. You'll, you'll, you'll get there at the end of the day. <laughs> See, there's two sort of stories running through the Bible. It's, it's the Shalom story. Have you ever heard of Shalom? That basically means peace to you and blessings and abundance. Just everything to go well with you in every aspect of life. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Right? You can also um, have the hardship story. Persecution, troubles, trials. 
And our response to that is, oh wow, you're really blessed. Everything's going really well. You know? You must be on the right track. You know, have faith. Life will go well. Have faith. Life will be hard. <laughs> I, I often hear like, oh man, everything's going well. Oh wow, that means this. You're, you're blessed. Oh man, I'm having a really tough time. Yeah, it's because God's at work and doing something. It's actually in the spiritual realm. You're having breakthrough. But in all that, and, and, and it's true, right? Stuff happens in life that's hard, and Jesus wants us about that. But also, I have, I've talked about the hard stuff, right? I have been so blessed. So blessed. So blessed. You know the story of Job? We went through some pretty horrible stuff. And then at the end of it all, God could help himself. He just poured out so much blessing on Job's life. So much more than he ever had had before. That's the nature of God. So he can enjoy his blessings, overflowing blessings, by living in him. And expect it. Expect to be blessed. But the love that we have with God will run so much deeper than that. Than all of that. It's like when someone gives you a present on your birthday or Christmas. It's really cool. It's like a reflection on the nature of the person giving it to you. I'm not much of a natural present receiver or giver. Sorry about that, for those. <laughs> and that way some people, it's an overflow of their life. Like they need to give a present. It's like they love language or living, like all it. And they love receiving presents. It just does something. Because for these people, it's like a reflection of what that person feels about them. But is it the person? Is the gift the person? No. It's just a sign that points you towards the love that the person has. So God will give us blessings. And it's not, it's not like we should start worshipping the blessing as we sometimes invite to do. God created the whole world, but apparently it's some people worship the sun and all sorts of weird stuff. It's like, no, 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 that's not the God. That's like the present that points us to God. <laughs> Gets us there is our love of God. 
That's what will get us through. In James chapter 5, verses 10 to 11, it says, Brothers and sisters, and it's an example of patience in the face of suffering. Take the prophets who, in the name of the Lord, uh, who spoke in the name of the Lord, as you know, we count as a blessing those who have persevered, you've heard Job's perseverance, and seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Hebrews 12, verse 2 and 7, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And verse 7 says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as children. What children are not disciplined by their father? <laughs> this is the encouraging message. <laughs> Last week, I really talked about basically taking the pressure off and just really enjoying it. I think that's important as we go about life. It was so, I don't know about you, but last week's sermon was so helpful to me because it was like, I can just go about life. I don't have to get results all the time. My responsibility is not to get anyone saved, not to get ministry done. It's about just letting God work through. It's God that opens hearts. It's God that does things and opens doors. And, if I'm, and he'll put me in the right places if I'm following him. And it's like, yeah, I can just live with joy. Yesterday at the wedding, I was like, you know, it was a real mix of different people, right? From all sorts of backgrounds. It's like, you know what? It's time for God to take over this atmosphere. I don't, for me, it was like, I don't care what anyone's done. God's going to take over. And God took over the atmosphere. It was a great, but I'm a God. I'm a Christ. I just talking to Wendy and Nat and other people who were listening in, I don't know, at the I was over here for the reception, there was music and stuff like that, and I don't care what anyone says or thinks, I'm going to dance like a crazy person, you know, that's how I got broke, good things can happen, I go, um, that was when she first met me, but it's like, yeah, it's like, just be free, we should be the most free people in the world, because we got something that, my pastors need to be affirmed or lied or anything, let's just be free. I don't think people in the world, like I think I said this one to look at this striving strength person like, oh please, come and give your life. They just want to see a bunch of free people and go, you know, I want to join that party. Mm. See, even Jesus, for the joy set before him, he was driven by joy. He endured the cross. So to endure, to be patient, to persevere, there needs to be a joy that gets us through that. Because when it gets hard, we need to go back to go, what do I have? The joy of my salvation. And we enjoy it.